I'm going to get to four questions. I'll get four questions in and that's it. <laughs> that's a fuck. That's a wrap, people. Hi, everyone. My name is Patrick Akil. And for today's episode, we have a special episode, Q&A one. I asked you all to send in your questions you might have about me or the podcast through LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you can find me. And I have a list of them. So we're going to get to them in this episode. The episode will be a little bit edited, edited, edited. For those kind of things, uh, just so it'll be a bit more smooth than usual. So let's get to it. All right, I'm going to blank some stuff out because they shared some info, which I probably shouldn't share on the air. But it basically boils down to this. I'm studying currently to become a software engineer at, well, XX University at XX country. Let's just blank it out right there. Um, I almost have the bachelor. Should I go for a master's? Now, this is an interesting thing because I kind of wondered that myself as well. I had my bachelor's degree in information studies, and then I was like, okay, I can do an information science, information studies, business information science, or even data science master. One of those. Um, You can see I didn't do that because I I barely know the names there. But I didn't end up doing that because I looked at the job market, and everywhere was required work experience. One or two years. Coming straight out of university, one or two years already. And I was like, I don't have that. I'm already behind. Like, What is a master's degree going to offer me? that work experience is not. So I told myself, and maybe too soon, you can see I make quick decisions sometimes, like maybe too quick. But um, I told myself, if I don't need a master's degree to pursue what I want professionally, then why do I need the master's degree? I'll start professionally. And when I come up on kind of a, a job title or a position that I do need that master's degree in, I told myself I'm still young enough to get that master's degree, but then at least I know what I want. Because the whole problem for me was not knowing what I wanted. So I would say, there's my advice. This is going to be a shorter question, I guess. If you know what you want and that requires a master's degree, get that master's degree. Because that's what you want at the end of the day. If you don't know that yet, then I would say start working, right? But it depends. Master's degree for me was also a lot of money. Uh, and money I wanted to earn as fast as possible as well. Um, but it's going to be your context and your decision. Don't let me decide for you. I'm just saying what I would have done or what I did. Uh, But yeah, the choice is yours. What advice would you give in getting your first job in the tech market? Now, that's a difficult one because it depends on what you want to do. So based on the podcast, I'm going to assume it's kind of in in tech, in software development, in web development, something like that. And the advice I would give is, I mean, probably also what I did, is start interviewing and figure out what you're not good at and start interviewing and get better at that. I learn by doing mostly. I don't like reading. I'm not a person that reads a lot. I read enough and then I seek experience to learn from there. Might not be the best advice, might not work from everyone, but what I did learn was, based on the questions that they're gonna ask, it's gonna kick off your thinking process. And as soon as your thinking process kicks in, you're gonna learn from yourself because externalizing what you already think internally is going to help you confirm some things, either what you want, what you don't want, and what you know and what you don't know. And based on what you don't know, you can take that next step, learn from there, and do better in the next interview round. I might have gone through the interview rounds. Hmm. Maybe I should rephrase this. I Maybe I should have picked organizations that I didn't actually want to go to, but I also picked organizations that I wanted to go to. Now, I don't know if that's wise, but... I really wanted those positions, so I really put in the effort to get to those positions. I knew I wasn't going to get them, or it was highly unlikely. But still, going through that rigor, going through those companies, and talking to them, honed my skills when it came to interviewing. Because interviewing is is a skill of its own. I suck at it probably now, still, because I haven't done it in a while. But when it comes to coding challenges and stuff like that, there's no better way than to actually start doing and practicing it, and getting that seat at the table and having that conversation. So that's my advice. Take it. Take it or leave it. I should should probably preface like, these questions and answers are very much based on my personal experience. Take it with a grain of salt, but still enjoy, I guess. (laughs) Okay, why don't you tweet more? Yeah, if I had stuff to tweet about, I would tweet more. Sometimes it's just blank. So that's why I don't tweet. (laughs) I love that one. That was pretty good. Oh, here's a difficult one. How do new engineers and developers Entering the field or studying to enter the field, cope with the recent layoffs from big tech companies. Now, 
I'm going to preface this also by saying, take it with a grain of salt, because I actually don't know. I'm not new in the field right now. When I was new was about five years ago, so I think something like that. But here's my take on the whole thing, the, the big tech layoffs, I guess. Layoffs happen, right? We've been in a really good market in COVID, people getting raises out the wazoo, getting hired left and right. And now there's layoffs. So you have that ebb and flow, and now it's going to be ebb, and soon it's going to be flow. We don't know when, but it will return to less layoffs, most likely, right? Now, in a period of layoffs, doesn't mean everyone is laying off, right? When it comes to organizations, you have to look at the different scale of things. Is it a small organization? Is it a startup? Is it a medium-sized organization? Or is it a big-sized organization? Based on the layoffs, you can see it mostly impacts big organizations. But the people that are struggling with hiring, the smaller organizations and the medium-sized organizations, now all of a sudden can hire the people that have been laid off. So I think when layoffs happen, you're always going to have options, right? Not just look at the size of the organization, but also the type of the organization. We have consultancies, we have agencies, we have product companies. If product companies are laying off people and they still need the technical expertise of those people, they're going to go to agencies or they're going to go to consultancies. So those companies are still going to keep hiring. It figures out, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you'll find your way. Whether you're laid off or whether you're struggling to enter and get your first job, it's a struggle for everyone. At some point, you're going to land it and you're going to go grow from there. I don't know if I'm satisfied with that answer, but that's kind of my take, I guess. There's no golden answer. There's no silver bullet. I can't give you what you're looking for. But I think there's ebb and flow. Now there's ebb because there's layoffs, but soon it will flow again and you'll get recruiters at the Wazoo on LinkedIn. Yeah, maybe that's just it. There's no golden answer there. What's your favorite podcast episode so far? Now, that's kind of an unfair one because I would throw people under the bus if I would uh, pick just one. No, I, I struggle with this because... My podcast episodes are really broad, right? We have on the one side more technical oriented topics, especially early on, we focused more on that. And now it's grown beyond that. I've done episodes with regards to coaching and leadership and listening and even startups and funding and, and product vision, right? So those are wildly different than the more technical episodes and, and picking between those is really hard to do. Now, having said that, I hope, and this is really my hope, that each episode is better than the last one. I can't always promise that happens, but I do think the way our conversation flows and the guests I have on and the value they add are getting better and better. That's not to take away from the people that have come on. I'm just enjoying the process more also because I've grown more and I'm learning more and I'm learning new things, new avenues. So with that being said, I like the later episodes more than I like the earlier ones. That's all I'm going to give you. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. Hi. I would love to know what the inspiration was behind the podcast. Oh, there's like three questions back to back. Let me start with the inspiration of the podcast. It's very simple. I started the podcast with my colleague, Martijn Eschmeyer. I think it's Eschmeyer, not Eschmeyer, but I thought it was Eschmeyer. I started the podcast with my colleague, Martijn Eschmeyer. He was new at the company and he said in an update call with about 50 consultants, listen, we do a lot with regards to knowledge sharing. We do a lot with regards to knowledge sharing, internally as well as externally. Externally, standing on stage, doing blog posts, and internally, we have knowledge exchange events, which we call XKEs, XBL Knowledge Exchanges, every other Tuesday or every first Tuesday of the month. Depends on which unit you're at. But through there, it's kind of like uh, going back to school. Someone prepares a topic, people sit down, and you have that interaction of someone explaining what they know, sharing their knowledge in that way, and people from the I would say public, but maybe the crowd. The crowd is probably a better word. So a lot of knowledge exchanges, a lot of knowledge shared internally as well as externally. He said it would be really cool to do a podcast in that way as well because of the knowledge that we already share and podcast is a cool medium. I'm looking for a host to do that. He said, I have someone. It's called Frank. Frank, my colleague, I know him. He said he doesn't want to do it, but if no one is a host, then he will do it. First of all, that's hilarious that someone says, listen, if no one does it, I'll do it, but I don't actually want to do it. So let someone else uh, pick up the ball. I think that's that's really cool. I talked to Frank about this and he has no regrets because he loves what, what we've done with the podcast. But with that being said, Martin also said, I'll give you all the support you'll need. 
all the support you want. And it's going to be your vision, your mission, whatever you want, we're going to do it. If you want to do it Dutch, if you want to do it English, if you want to do it once a week, once a month, I don't care. Whatever you want to do is what we're going to do. Now, I have been listening to podcasts for the last 10 years, probably. Started with PKA, listened to a lot of Joe Rogan and other podcasts in there as well. Lately, Trash Chased, which is pretty cool. But getting back to things, that sounded like music to my ear. So the next day I hit him up and I said, uh, yeah, I listened to what you said on the update call. I want to be that host. I have an idea of what I wanted to do, what I want to do. Uh, So let's see if we can execute on that. He was like, that's pretty funny because no one replied in that update call. So he went to my manager and he said, give me a list of people that I can reach out to. And apparently my name was on that list. And it's pretty cheesy to say it was on top of that list. So Yeah, that's what he said. I don't know if I believe that. But (laughs) moving on from there, we started brainstorming on, well, not necessarily ideas because I had an idea in my head. I wanted to talk about stuff, not just coding, but stuff around coding. You might say beyond coding. Everything having to do with coding and creating software. Humans creating software. That was kind of the phrase in my head that we had. So we started with that, and from there we started looking at the name of the actual podcast. We had, actually I should look this up. Maybe I can find them. Because we had some good names, actually. All right, I'm going to give all the names. All the names of the, this is the brainstorm that we had, Martijn and me. All right, it's going to be Viewling IT with an F. I don't know exactly about that one. Code Logics, Code Build, The Dev Life, A Life in Coding, Suits and hoodies, that that one made it to the top two. I'll put a image of me with a suit and a hoodie. That's our promo image. I'll put it right there. Uh, yeah. Code and suits, didn't make it anywhere. Coding business, more than coding, beyond coding. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, the coders podcast, the full stack life and full stacked. Man, we have some great naming sense. <laughs> That's hilarious, actually. I still have those. Yeah. So uh, we picked the top two from that based on uh, friends and family, which we call it. We asked around in our own network. Then with the company and the people that we have, we did a poll. Suits and hoodies versus Beyond Coding. And Beyond Coding actually won. Now, when I went to Martine, I said, I'd love to do the podcast, but I have a few prerequisites. I think it was three or maybe four. Let me, let me start with one. Has to be in English. I don't want to do it in Dutch has to be in English. I want to reach out to people internationally, overseas, not just in Holland, but everywhere. So it has to be English. Next, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right, which means weekly episodes. I don't compromise for bi-weekly. It has to be weekly. We're going to do it weekly or we're not going to do it. He was like, whatever, man. That's going to be more work, but also for you. So deal with it. I was like, hell yeah, weekly. Then number three, I don't want any edits. That's a big one because I thought from my perspective, My English wasn't as good yet. I was saying a lot of ums. I was a lot figuring out what to say, the questions as well. And I thought for me, the fastest way to get that out of there is to just not do it, which also means not edit them out. Because if I listen to myself and I listen to myself and I hate myself, then I'm going to get better at actually doing the things and I'm going to like listening to myself. Either it's going to fix itself in my head or I'm actually going to get better at speaking. So yeah. Maybe I, maybe I figured that out in hindsight, but I wanted to do no edits. I wanted to do it as authentic as possible. Um, and so I ended up naming three. Yeah, those might have been the only three then. <laughs> so yeah, with those, uh, with those prerequisites in mind, we started, we had a name. We went to Fiverr to get, uh, oh, Fiverr. Fiverr sponsored me, Fiverr. Yeah, we went to Fiverr to get the intro, uh, the little jingle with there as well. And once we had the jingle, I already knew through my own network and the colleagues that we have here, who I want to as a full, as a first guest, it was going to be Urs Peter. Urs Peter, do I have his name? Because I always say Peters and it's always Peter. Urs Peter. Urs Peter. Yeah, nailed it. Nailed it on the first time. I edit that out. Nailed it on the first time. <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, I spoke with Urs. Um, we figured out a main topic that we wanted to talk about. We recorded the episode was one of the meeting rooms upstairs way behind me, second floor. We put up two cameras, and those two cameras needed to halt at 30 seconds, and the micro SD cards needed to switch, and then we could resume again. So that was the first episode. I don't think that episode is on YouTube. 
because Martin did actually end up heavily editing that episode. So yeah, we had to be like, uh, that was not what we discussed. But yeah, he wanted to really focus on audio quality or whatever. So that video is gone. You won't find it on YouTube. Great first episode though. Coming out of that first episode, I saw my other colleague, Sergio Beaumont, sitting there. I might do an episode with him in the future, actually, in the near future. But I saw him sitting there in uh, in one of the on one of the desks, on one of the desks, in front of one of the desks. English. I saw him sitting there in front of one of the desks, and I asked, or I said to him, "Listen, we're doing this podcast right now. I'm really happy with it. I really want to go do more with it. Do you want to be a first guest? Do you want to be a second guest?" Do you want me second guess? That's what I said. He was like, yeah, we'll do it next week. I was like, yeah. And that was the second guess. It's pretty easy. (laughs) Now with my first two episodes recorded, I talked to Martin and I said, when are we airing this thing? Because I do want to air those episodes. I don't care if they're quality wise less than what we actually aim for. I thought they were great. I was loving it from the get go. But obviously we were going to get better, but I didn't want to get better first and then start airing i wanted to air the whole process even though i didn't like my voice even though i didn't like some of the questions i asked or some of the dynamic there i wanted to air or start airing as soon as possible get feedback as soon as possible and start rolling with this thing so we decided once we had five episodes we would air episode number one and that's what we did we started recording five episodes we asked each and every guest well now that you've come on and kind of figured out the vibe in the episode that we did Do you have other people in your network, which might be a good fit for the episode? And actually, I've done that each and every single episode. So we really use the network of the network effect when it comes to getting guests. And the ball just kept rolling from there. I actually figured out what my fourth requirement was. Maybe it was my first, but I told Martin I don't want to talk about coding. I don't want to talk about coding at all. I don't want to talk about more technical stuff. I want to talk about everything that's around tech, I guess, which also fits with the name Beyond Coding. Because that's also where my interest lies, right? I still do consultancy 95% of the time. I get like four hours a week to film these episodes. So I use it to the utmost of my ability and don't talk about coding. So (laughs) that's a personal preference. I get the most enjoyment talking to people about what they're passionate about. Uh, And I just really love that it's not about coding. Uh, Not to say I don't like coding. I like programming still. But just... Programming and podcasting, I don't think they work quite well as a medium because at some point you need some visuals. You know what I'm saying? Talking about everything around that, someone's history, someone's passion, what they believe in mission vision wise, that's way easier through a podcast. So that was number four when it came to to my prerequisites there. I knew I had a fourth one. (laughs) What made you want to start the podcast and how did you decide on the topic? Now I answered probably two of them. What made me decide, I probably said yes way too quickly, looking in hindsight. I never knew all the work involved or any, everything that I was going to do. I was listening to a lot of podcasts back then, and I just really loved the idea of having a seat at the table. Listening to podcasts, sometimes you would th- figure out questions or think of questions that would remain unanswered, right? And that's not really satisfying, especially for the listener. So I thought if I would get a seat at the table, it's very, very greedy, very arrogant, Uh, But I would love to ask those questions and not remain unanswered, at least for me. Because I'm, if I record an episode, I'm listener number one, right? I might be the host, but I'm also a listener. So asking the questions that I would love to ask is really just a privilege. So very greedily, very quickly, I said yes. I was like, yes, let's do this. I would love to, yes. And then all the other work involved came later. Not to say that I don't like it, but... It is a lot of effort. A podcast doesn't just appear magically. There's work and effort involved, blood, sweat, and tears. I had to throw out episodes that I thought weren't up to par, throw out episodes which had an echo, which I hated to do because they were great episodes. But here we are, 80 episodes further. Curious to know what goes into creating a podcast episode. Now, we kind of had to refine this process. What I do is I find people on Twitter. I find people on LinkedIn. I find people through the people that I already have had on that say these people would be a great next guest. Now I reach out to them or I get connected to them through the guests that I've had on. And I say, listen, we're doing this podcast. It's about kind of the human side of creating software. Would you be interested? When they say yes, I'm like, okay, let's do a 30 minute call. Now, apparently that's already a bottleneck for some people. They don't want to do the initial 30 minute call. From my perspective, 
if we can't do a 30 minute call, usually if I've never met you, I don't want to do the episode. Might sound stupid, might sound short, but I want to know the dynamic of the person that's going to sit in front of me, whether it's in person or whether it's remote. I think that's really important for the actual quality of the episode. So I've had to say no to people that said, uh, no 30 minute episode. Can we just record the full episode? I'd had to say, I had to say, and I still say no to those people that I've never met before. Uh, to some people that I've met before, I know what I will have with them. I know the dynamic that we already have. So when they say, listen, can we just record the first episode? Like we know each other. I'm like, okay, we know each other. I mean, it's fine. Or I suggest it. But for the people that I've never met and they want to skip that intro call, that's a no-go for me or a red flag in there. So once we have that intro call, we high over discuss a topic. As I still want to keep that topic authentic, we don't go in depth at all. Usually it takes about like 10 to 15 minutes. I ask, what are you passionate about? That's usually the topic because whatever people are passionate about, if I've done my research or if my people, my guests have done their research as well, usually that's a shared passion. That's something I'm interested in, something I'm curious about and something they can offer within the episode. So that's what we cover as well. Then everything from there, I discuss with them that we aim for 45 minutes. In practice, is about 50 plus minutes, but that's fine. Uh, I ask them what they don't want to talk about. And most people say, I'm an open book, ask me whatever, and I'll answer any question. Some people say, I can't talk about this. I don't like talking about this, specifically like some COVID related things, um, which I appreciate and which I uphold during the conversation as well. Don't want to make anything or anyone uncomfortable in there. Then we schedule the episode, we record the episode. It's just a natural conversation. I used to say, three, two, one, clap, start, let's go. We don't do that anymore. It makes the guest uncomfortable, makes me uncomfortable. And you just talk over each other. You bumble a bit through the intro and then you actually start rolling. What we do now is once a guest calls in, when a guest sits down in front of me, uh, we make sure the recording is recording. I don't think that's how you say it. We make sure everything is recording from the get-go. I explain that to them as well. We do a little chit chat and then I turn on podcast mode. Then we're live. Not really live, but we're already recording. So we have that conversation. And some guests have said to me, oh, I didn't know we were recording, but I thought it must have been already 40 minutes in. So probably, yeah, the cameras are rolling. And they're right. In editing, in post, I'm like, okay, this is a good moment to start the episode. Then we have the full conversation. That's what you'll probably listen to. And that's then the episode. I put the intro jingle in front. Oh, I record the episode intro after the actual conversation we've had just to get a better feel of what we talked about as well as what the people actually had to offer through that show, uh, or through that episode, and who they really are. I feel like I can better introduce them than as a host as well. So, yeah, we do some editing. We make some smaller clips, subtitle those, and share those on socials. And that's the full process of a podcast episode as I do it. I know some people do it differently. Some people don't do the intro call. They just straight up do the episode. Very strange to me. I don't know how they do it. This is my process. Why haven't you invited my favorite person X, Y, and Z on YouTube or like celebrity tech wise? Yeah, I probably have, but they never reach back to me. So if you feel like you want someone as a guest, tag me or tag them and we'll make it happen. But usually they don't reply. It's really hard reaching out to people that have like 100k subscribers or 100k followers or what what have you they don't reply which is fair right they probably have a lot of people tagging them what's your favorite podcast now i used to listen to a lot of episodes actually a lot more back in the day and lately i haven't been listening as much one of those things one of those reasons is because i have a girlfriend i don't think she's going to listen to this but yeah uh, when you have a girlfriend you have way less free time so less podcasting second thing i have a podcast Listen to myself quite often when I need to edit. And yeah, that's kind of my podcast appetite then. It's done. I do listen when I have a bit more time to trash taste. It's about anime. It's nothing about tech. It's about Japan and the culture, which I love. And sometimes here and there, Joe Rogan still, when he brings out an episode with an interesting guest. I used to listen a lot to PKA. PKA has like 600 episodes and they have a secondary podcast, which has like 400 episodes. It's insane. But... Their first 200 episodes, I probably listened to them. And I probably listened to them like twice or thrice. Because I used to listen a lot while I was gaming. Because gaming, at some point, you're like, okay, I'm proficient at gaming. I still want to learn some things. So I would listen to a podcast, 
and still keep gaming. Whether it's like shooters or whether it's like strategy games online. Used to play a lot of Hearthstone. Hearthstone? Man, that's a hard word. Hearthstone. Yeah. Used to play a lot of Hearthstone. And uh, would just listen to podcasts day in, day out during playing those video games. Yeah, I miss those days. Good old days. Really good old days. Now I'm old. Have to work. Have to make money. Yeah. Life is weird. Have you ever been a guest on a podcast? Actually, I have been. I've been on Kenji's podcast. I've been on... Man, do I have to name all the names now? That's going to be awkward. Have to stall for time. Figure out the names. Figure out the names. Figure out the names. Patrick. Neil Thompson's podcast. Figure out more names. Oh, actually, those are the two podcasts. I might go on three more, which I'm in the talks with, which might appear soon-ish. I've learned that a lot more people have a bigger backlog than I have. So Neil's episode and I was like two or three months ago, and it just recently aired. So yeah, but I have been on the other side of the table. I like coming on as a guest because I do almost zero preparation. The host does all the thinking and the asking questions, and I just go with the flow. Sometimes ramble a bit too much. Guesting is hard. Uh, but is it vain to say I like episodes where I'm in a guest in? Maybe it is. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Scratch that. Off the record. No, that's fine. Yeah, I like guesting as well. Hosting is a different ball game. I really like hosting because I'm curious. I get to ask questions and learn. But guesting is, uh, is sharing what you know, sharing your experiences as well. And who doesn't love sharing what they've experienced, right? Yeah. Awkward wink. What's your take on hiring in tech? Now, I'm going to assume that you mean kind of a standard way of hiring where you get kind of a coding assessment, I guess. The way I got this job, this job at Xevia, was also through multiple rounds. First round with my manager, as well as the uh, recruiter in that way. Talk about the culture and the mission of the company and the values that it offers. And the second one was a coding assessment. Now, it was a take-home exercise. Uh, the exercise was quite large, actually. They said, on an average, you would have to spend like eight hours on it to complete it. Only spend eight hours, actually, because if you need more, then you need more, and we'll just have to discuss what you didn't finish. So I took that exercise. I ended up spending 10 to 12 hours on it, and I was honest about that. I said, this is what I can. If it's not good enough, then uh, this is not my ball game. This is too high of a level. But it can be quite confronting. I like take-home exercises more than I like live coding. I don't like lead code exercises because those are usually not realistic and representable of what you would do when you actually land the job. So when it comes to coding exercises, I think they can be fruitful. I think they have evolved though, and more and more companies are doing some sort of pair programming, some sort of talking through code, talking about code, more so than actually solving an algorithm, which I like. So I like that trend. I think everyone or every company, rather than looking at what other people are doing or what other companies are doing, should look at what they do on a more day-to-day -day and test for that. And I'm also of the mindset that if people can't do it, they can learn it. The right people can with the right amount of eagerness and the right amount of drive. So look for those people rather than people that can just do a trick and solve an algorithm. That's, uh, that's my opinion. Yeah. In my company, actually, I'm working on an early in career program where we're going to train a lot of people that are a bit more early in career when it comes to their technical skills. So we really, when hiring, focus on drive and motivation. And we're going to train for skill, which, uh, yeah, I think is going to help a lot of people. And it's fun to train people that are really eager and driven as well. So I can't wait. Do you hate your own voice? Um, yes and no. At the beginning, I really hated my own voice because I hear them through these headphones. That's why I have them on. So I can better hone into a conversation and actually see if I'm on the microphone, even though I suck at it sometimes. But episode number one, I was like, can we turn this off, please? I don't want to hear myself when I'm talking. Luckily, it kind of merges and I'm fine with it now. I mean, it should be after like 80 episodes. But in the beginning, I was really struggling with it. So I just had to be like, okay, this comes with the job. Just deal with it. Just deal with it. Just don't think about it. Because I think a lot of people don't like their own voice. Now it's completely fine because I've edited so many episodes. I've listened to myself. So it's just a voice. It's just another voice to me. Other people, and this is going to sound really vain, so maybe I shouldn't say this. Other people say that I have a quite, uh, how do you say that? Other people say that I have a good podcast voice, which I really appreciate. If you're one of those people, thank you. It means a lot to me. 
how did you get into software development? Now, that's an interesting one because I didn't study computer science, actually. I studied information studies or information science, as people call it, which is kind of on the fine line between business analytics, business science, business studies, rather, and computer science. So right in between there. And we did a lot of stuff with regards to data analytics, data science, but not necessarily computer science. So coming out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I thought I would choose very broadly and broadly was information studies. I had some other options, but throughout my high school, I had to pick some courses here and there, some electives as well. And based on those courses, based on those choices, I couldn't do all the studies that I wanted to do. So I went with information studies because that was available to me, was still in line with what I wanted to do, uh, which was a little bit in tech, uh, but still super broad for me to figure out what I actually wanted to do down the line. So going into information studies was a three-year program. After I was done, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I like data science. I like working with programming languages. Mainly we, we learned Python and some web development stuff as well. But I didn't know exactly if I wanted to be a data scientist or a data analyst, something like that. So I started applying for jobs. I applied for probably a lot more jobs than I should have. Uh, but I told myself I wanted to get better at interviewing because I sucked at interviewing. Man, if you were to ask me what is like the worst experience of getting a first job, I, I would say it's the interviewing experience. I don't like sitting at a table with another person judging me, uh, or at least that's, <laughs> that's what I felt at the time. My worst experience in there was, uh, it was a computer science role, junior developer role, and it was at, uh, I probably shouldn't name the name, but it was some kind of bank, some kind of Dutch bank, you'll probably figure it out. Um, but it was for a programming language I'd never programmed in. So first round, I came to the office and they said, well, well, we already preceded in some, uh, some talks. I had a really good first round. They really liked me, I thought. So I was invited to the second round, which was going to be kind of a pair of programming or rather mob programming situation where it wasn't a programming language that I never had written in with a group of people, which were probably all seniors, probably some meteors, but definitely no juniors. So I was the only junior there. And really confronting when they type something in a keyboard, pass it to the other person, they know what to do. And then it comes to me and I just completely blank out. I had no clue what I needed to do, no clue about the syntax. They try explaining things here and there, but I just completely shut down. That was probably one, one of the most horrifying experiences I've ever had. But I completely derailed the question. See, guesting on a podcast is way more difficult than hosting, apparently. I'm going to get back to it. So... I finally landed a job in operations uh, at Blocker Holding. If you check out my LinkedIn, you can see all the, the job history stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to get to all of those questions with regards to job history. But I joined, Blocker, I joined Blocker Holding, which is a holding company of a lot of the retail organizations in the Netherlands. Think about Blocker, Intertoys, uh, Xenos at the time, Lane Bucker as well. And they came together with a joint venture in kind of centralizing their IT systems, making it a more smooth operation by joining forces with the knowledge they have, so they can distribute it and be better off it on a retail level. So I joined that because, first of all, operations, you get to touch a lot of aspects. But for me, I didn't know operations. I didn't even know left from right when it came to software development or operations in that way. I just thought it's a super broad landscape. I'm going to get a lot of responsibility and a lot of freedom to touch on a lot of things and really learn what I like. So that's why I picked well, that's why I chose that role, and that's why I actually joined. The, ended up joining the company. Man, getting tired of talking by myself to a microphone and a camera. But to get back to it, when I joined in operations, I learned a lot in a really fast-paced way. I got the opportunity to fail fast, learn fast, and grow from there. Uh, and I basically had a great manager, which gave me all the freedom that I wanted and the responsibility that I wanted as well. I could go up to him and say, listen, I'm comfortable where I am or comfortable enough. Give me more. What's the next step? I want to do this. And he would make it happen. I wanted to do more database management. And he would put me next to the database management teams. Uh, and I would learn from there. Them and there. <laughs> Just mer merge those words right there. Yeah. Really fun time, actually. Uh, a really fun experience in there as well. But I was, at the end of the day, responsible for application management on the operational side. From there, I could see what went wrong in production. But when it actually came to fixing things, 
I wasn't responsible. I would have to kind of figure out what was wrong and then pass that to a different team that was responsible at the end of the day, which was also frustrating because throughout my history, I did learn a little bit about programming languages and software and how it runs in and of its own. So I could figure out, I could even browse through the code and figure out what was wrong here and there. Yet, I, it was stupid because I didn't, I wasn't allowed and I wasn't responsible to make those changes, which I get if you're in a traditional organizations and operation and development is completely separated, then yeah, that, those are kind of your roles and responsibilities there. But to me, I wanted to do as much as possible and have as much ownership from the get-go. So after figuring out that I wanted to do more with regards to software development, I looked online and I saw DevOps was an up-and-coming term everywhere. Development and operations. You build it, you run it in production as well. I was like, this is 100% what I wanted to do. So I did two things. I went back to my manager and I said, listen, this is what I want to do. I want to do more with regards to, I want to do more with regards to software development. And I also started looking outside just because I had been with the company for not even a year, I would say like nine to 10 months. And I thought if I can't do this in this company, then I have to look outside, right? I was very driven, very young, very passionate. So once I figured out what I wanted to do and what I wanted to dabble my feet wet in, I went for that 100%. So I did both things. I started applying again, uh, applied at another big bank, applied at another few organizations just to get better at interviewing in there as well. Figure out what I really wanted to do because those are usually the questions you get. And from answering those questions, really figured out what I wanted to do, really honed um, answering that as well. But luckily within the organization, my manager talked to another manager of e-commerce and they contacted me and they said, listen, if you want to do software development, then you have to be at the e-commerce side of things. I can make that happen. Now he said that, and he said that probably way too quickly because the next day we had a huge reorganization, which means he couldn't make that happen anymore. So we had another conversation and he said, listen, I can't make that happen right now. You're gonna have to apply to either the retail organizations or the e-commerce side of things, which was gonna be its own entity. And I mean, I know your name. I know the roles that are gonna be available. If there's a role for you in there, I'll contact you and you'll have the role. And I was like, well, that seemed easy. To cut it a bit more short, because I've been rambling, I ended up joining the e-commerce side of things, not as a software engineer, but as an enterprise service bus developer. Now, I didn't know exactly what that meant. I just thought I would learn a lot of software engineering fundamentals and work from there. You know, you start somewhere and you just work your way up. That was kind of my mantra. But in there wasn't a lot of work, actually. There was one senior person and he worked there three days a week and he wanted to get stuff done. And the attention he gave to me was kind of a side thing. Now I appreciate the attention he gave to me, but three days a week where you're also doing something else and you also have to educate one person. Yeah, it's not gonna be a lot or even enough for me. So I went back to my then, it was a new manager actually. He just joined one week and I already said, listen, this is not gonna fly for me. I got this new role, but there's no work in it. I don't get the attention and the love I need, but I still wanna do software engineering. That's what I told them. I said, listen, I know we do stuff. I know we do really cool stuff. I wanna do that. Uh, so he looked into the organization. He saw we had software engineers uh, building the e-commerce platform. And he said, listen, these are all consultants. These are all external people. At some point, they're gonna to have to knowledge transfer that to the people that are internal. He said, we don't have a lot. We don't have many people there, but you can be that person if you want to. I would say, listen, Patrick is new here. You have to knowledge transfer as much as you know to him. And you would be able to get up and running whatever they have and contribute in your own way as well. So that sounded like music to my ears. It was completely greenfield. It was go on the back end. It was view on the front end. Uh, and that's where I really started. They were like, okay, sit down. Okay. Do you know what Git is? I was like, yeah, kind of. They explained the concepts, they explained the command line, they explained, uh, I mean, I don't know the actual application because I ended up using the command line. And we rolled from there. We picked up a user story, made the changes in a pair programming sense. I put up my pull request, I was really proud until I got like 40, 50 remarks. And I was like, damn, okay, these people know what they're talking about because none of that stuff I thought about. So rinse and repeat and learn from there. That's kind of how my software engineering journey began. And I'm really happy it started there because I got a lot of love and attention that I needed um, with regards to the level I was at. And the growth curve through that has just been 
yeah, extremely high. I think it has to do with me as a person, but also the environment that I was in. So I feel really lucky to end up there. I kind of stumbled and bumbled my way to that spot, which I'm really happy about. However, comma, I think that is the episode. I think I went through all of your questions, hopefully all of the questions. If there's any questions that have remained unanswered, feel free to drop them in the comments below. On Spotify, on YouTube, I think on both those platforms, you can add comments nowadays, which is pretty cool. And with that being said, thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next one.